On this episode of the Discover the Word podcast, Rasul Berry is going to be leading the conversations and exploring what can help men to be more whole. We're at a time where it's been well documented that men are struggling in various different ways, even dropping out of workplace, college. Look around in our churches, oftentimes you'll see less men there than women. So what do you think could be helpful in stemming that tide and helping us address some of those challenges that men are facing in our world today? Yeah, that's the question that we hope our conversations will help with. And those are questions that the Whole Man Project from Our Daily Bread Ministries addresses. It's a project in which Christian black men speak into common issues that many men face and encourages the spiritual development of your whole self, your head, heart, hands, and soul. Dr. Malik Blade will join Rasul in talking with Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Daniel Ryan Day about the whole man. And welcome to Discover the Word, a Bible engagement effort of Our Daily Bread Ministries, and an episode of the podcast in which Rasul and Malik are going to focus on four areas that the scriptures say are crucial to living a whole and balanced life when it comes to our relationship with God and our relationships with others. Wellness, wholeness in these four areas is tremendously important. And so they'll take us to a passage in the Bible that identifies those four areas and then spend the next hour or so breaking them down and helping us understand what it looks like to live into them as a whole person. And I will also be telling you more about the Whole Man Project and some of the print and video resources that are available to take you further down this path. And so let's get started and listen as Rasul introduces uh, Dr. Malik Blade and our week talking about the Whole Man. Well, I'm excited to introduce not only a new book and video series from our Daily Bread Ministries called The Whole Man Project, but also a friend. So the Whole Man Project includes two different resources. There's the devotional book called The Whole Man, 40 Spiritual Reflections from Black Men for the Head, Heart, Hands, and Soul. Hmm. And then there's a video series that accompanies it as well, where we have some real important conversations around what does it mean to be holistically connected to God and in each other. And I'm also thrilled that we have one of the co-editors of The Whole Man, uh, Dr. Malik Blade, joining us at the table today to help us open up the scriptures. Mm-hmm. Malik, thanks so much for coming through. Thanks for the invite. Glad to be here. Looking forward to opportunity to chop it up with everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Malik just received a significant academic and professional milestone. So tell us about that and why you decided to contribute to the Whole Man Project. Yeah. In 2019, I got the notice that I was accepted into a doctoral program that I was really not sure how it was going to go because I (laughs) didn't even envision going to college at first. But I found myself here looking at a third degree doctor of education and counseling. Mm. So I began that in 2020 and now have completed And I wrote, as far as my dissertation, was on the most common reasons that black men are in counseling. Interesting. Uh, Because there is somewhat of an an uptick in terms of interest in mental health generally, but also specifically in the black community. But amongst that, there is an underrepresentation of diagnosis and study as it relates to black men. So as an overlooked group, I wanted to take my educational experience to kind of focus in on that. And also to have some more stuff in writing because I do manage a nonprofit that connects black men with mental health professionals. So wanted to create more resources and kind of normalize the conversation as it relates to mental health. So that's kind of what my, my studies focused on. And then as it relates to the whole man project, we were able to contextualize this conversation about mental health, particularly for black men in the context of Christianity. So what does this look like for Christian black men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this was a project that really we decided to be a part of because there's some very startling statistics about men in general in our society. Unprecedented numbers of men have been dropping out from the workforce, college, dating and friendships. A few stats. Uh, The Survey of American Life found that in the U.S., the number of men who reported having no friends went from 3% in 1990 to 15% in 2021. 
We see even in the church, many men disappearing. The gender gap right now is 61% female in the average American church, 39% male. And we see specifically some of these things really hit home in the African-American community. So despite the fact that African-Americans are our largest ethnic group to attend worship, 70 to 80 percent of black men do not attend churches. Mm. And so these gaps are increasing in number and they are really even fatal. Like, you know, we talk about the loneliness issues, the sense of isolation, some of these other consequences. We're seeing the rates of even suicide go up, you know, with males make up only 50 percent of the population, but 80 percent of suicides. And so there's a lot of brokenness around us in our world. So the whole man project seeks to address this by speaking to these issues and specifically from the standpoint of black Christian men. But though it's coming from that cultural context, it's something that's relatable to all of us. And uh, just like we look at the Hebrew scriptures come from a very Jewish context, but it's relatable and accessible to all of us. And so we're glad that you're at the table, (laughs) Elisa. Well, I can't wait to learn. I'm sure I'm going to add a whole bunch. (laughs) You know, and and as well, Daniel and Bill. And so, so yeah, that's kind of the basis for what we're going to look at and the format of the whole man book and that we're going to have in these next few conversations is head, heart, hands, and soul. Hmm. And we get that from other men who were struggling in the scriptures in the time of Jesus with the questions of life and issues. And there was one man in particular that we see struggling in Mark chapter 12. So we want to look at that and kind of unpack that passage. So Bill and Daniel, could you kind of take turns reading that passage, Mark chapter 12? Sure. Beginning in verse 28. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he, Jesus, answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other beside him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to them, You are not far from the kingdom of God. One of the things I think I've been guilty of sometimes when I read this passage is the significance of this question. I almost can kind of approach it like Bible trivia, you mm-hmm. know, like that, that the sense of the question is kind of like simply, okay, of all the 600 plus mm-hmm. commandments, which one is the most important? Yeah. And I think that there's something deeper going on when we look at the Hebraic perspective on the commandments of God in general. Let's just kind of visit that for a second. Like what was the relationship between Jews and the law and how might that be different from the relationship that we, when we think about the law? Yeah. Well, I think when they're given the law or instruction, law is not even a a great term, right? When they're given instruction and it's about what life looks like in the way that God has ordered the world. So this is what it looks like to live life in the world as God is calling us to live it. When God hands that to them, they see it as life-giving and progressive in their culture at the time. (laughs) Like this is revolutionary. Mm -hmm. This is new. It's different than some of the law codes from other places. It connects us with God. Each one of us is called to live this out, not just the king or a small group of people. We're all called into relationship with God. So I think by the time you know, we get to the New Testament and hear about the law. We've kind of thought of it as a negative thing, but when they were handed it, it was a hugely positive, revolutionary Mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, it was, I think, in its simplest form, it was intended to give the people instructions to your word, Daniel, on how to relate to God and how to relate to one another. And you can see those natural divisions, even in the Ten Commandments, the first several commandments are how they relate to God and the rest are all how they related to one another as people. And uh, that became kind of the core around which Jewish life wrapped itself. And even the way it was given with Moses going up to Sinai, personally convening with God, Mm -hmm. radical, radical. I was just thinking about just updating it until today that in many ways, 
a lack of understanding about what God presents affects our perspective. Mm -hmm. So I think even in, in the devotional, I discussed this idea of we can look at something as a prison or mm -hmm. a protective guardrail. Mm -hmm. We could be looking at the same thing, mm -hmm. but it affects how we receive what's being presented. And I think in the context of when we look at uh, deviations from instructions that God has given, there tends to be disorder. So when we can look at the present day, when we deviate from what's being presented to us, we will probably understand better after you burn your hand on the on the stove that yeah. that was more of a protective barrier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so good. Yeah. And and I think that's when we start to really get into the perspective and the value of the law from the Jewish people. And I think one of the all right, Bible trivia, what's the longest chapter in the Bible? Is it Psalm 119? Yeah. Psalm 119. Technically, do I, do I it's a not ribbon? a chapter. <laughs> <laughs> what is the log? Yes. yes. <laughs> Psalms. Yeah. That, all right. Let me rephrase. <laughs> uh, longest section pericope. of you know, <laughs> verses. Yes. Pericope. In any case, whatever we want to call Psalm 119. Psalm 119 yeah. is over 175 verses. Yeah. It's the longest psalm. We'll go with that. And, and when we <laughs> look go. at it. This is one of the things it says in verse 25, my soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. When I told of my ways, you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts and I will meditate on your wondrous works. My soul melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Mm -hmm. One of the yeah. things I love about Psalm 119 is there's so many different nouns that are even used to talk about the law, mm -hmm. statutes, commands, word, mm -hmm. precepts. Mm -hmm. But all of it is like this love letter to God because of his word. So when I think about the relationship in terms of how they saw the law or the commands or the instructions, mm -hmm. it was not just like the sense of burdensome task. It was like, this is life giving. Mm -hmm. This is like you said, Malik, the guardrails. Mm -hmm. And so when this question is asked to Jesus, like, which is the greatest commandment? There isn't just this sense of trivia. It's actually a sense of how can I live life the best possible way? And Jesus's response isn't just taken out of thin air. In fact, he's quoting another passage, which is known as the Shema. What do we know about the Shema and why is, what's its significance in the nation of Israel? It was kind of like their national motto. <laughs> I mean, you recited it several times a day. It was an affirmation of what made them as a people unique among the ancient nations because they had one God. The Lord our God is one. Mm -hmm. Whereas the the surrounding nations had pluralities of deities that they worshiped. Yep. And also even the word at the beginning here, O Israel, has with it both hearing and walking this out or living this out or obeying. Yeah. And so it's not just, hey, listen to what I have to say. It's walk into this. Let yeah. this become a part of your life mm -hmm. and shape who you become. You know, living in today's world is very complex for lots of different reasons. We've seen men get left behind or struggling in, in different ways. And it really does serve as a helpful reminder that this response from Jesus, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself, isn't just a, a trivial answer, but it's something that can actually lead to wholeness. The path mm -hmm. to wholeness is one that is found in integration with our lives in God and all of who we are, right? And so we're gonna break down heart, soul, strength, and mind and the rest of our conversations and see how that relates to what it looks like to love God with our head, our hearts, our hands, and our soul. And over the next few conversations, we're gonna unpack how loving God like that will lead to our own wholeness. Live and be whole. Yeah, the whole man. Reflections on the heart, head, hands, and soul. That's where our conversations are going this episode of the Discover the Word podcast. Rasul Berry and Dr. Malik Blade are leading the group through a closer look at those four aspects mentioned in the greatest commandment. And at the table with Rasul and Malik are regular group members, Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Daniel Ryan Day. Now, as we discuss the Whole Man Project and some of the foundational ideas that it's based on, we also want to make you aware of some of the resources that support this amazing project. The Whole Man Project is part of Voices, 
which is a facet of Our Daily Bread Ministries, which develops and distributes resources by black Christian content creators for communities of color. And so before we get into those four aspects of the Great Commandment and how they influence our wholeness, we'd like you to listen to a conversation that Rasul and Malik had about the Whole Man Project and their passion for it. Hey, it's Rasul Berry from Discover the Word, and I am here with Dr. Malik Blade to introduce to you a new project from Our Daily Bread Ministries called The Whole Man Project. Malik, why are you excited about The Whole Man Project? I'm excited because I think it's an opportunity for us as Christian men to address some of the things that men are seeing in the culture today and present some nuance that challenges us to grow, but also deals with some truths that may not be as welcomed in other circles. Yeah. So the whole man is both a devotional book and a video series. We're at a time where, you know, it's been well documented that men are struggling in various different ways, even dropping out of workplace, college look around in our churches, oftentimes you'll see less men there than women. So how do you think this book could be helpful in stemming that tide and helping us address some of those challenges that men are facing in our world today? Yeah. One thing that stands out to me specifically is this idea that's happening in our culture of redefining of what a man is. Many probably have heard the term toxic masculinity and may hear that as an indictment on masculinity as a whole. I think we're able to come in here and maintain biblical principles and affirm what it means to be a man as God defined it. But to also understand that there are areas for growth in how we perceive masculinity. There are some aspects that may be more influenced by American culture than biblical truth. Mm. So we have a unique opportunity to address some of the shifts within culture, affirm the good, but also challenge the areas that we might have thought were good, but are actually counter to the biblical principles. Yeah, that is so true. And so this whole man project has both a devotional book, 40 spiritual reflections that come specifically to address the different issues of head, heart, hands, and soul. We also have four videos that are discussions with men that come with discussion guides. And all of this is surrounding this aspect of helping those who are broken figure out what it means to be a man in Christ, come to that sense of wholeness through the whole man. So you can check it out at experiencevoices.org forward slash whole man. And uh, we look forward to being a part of that journey with you as we move toward wholeness together. Live and be whole. Yeah, thanks, Rasul and Malik. Uh, that website again, experiencevoices.org slash whole man. Experiencevoices.org slash whole man. It's part of our Voices collection here at Our Daily Bread Ministries. All right, so now let's listen as they explore the first of the four aspects of the greatest commandment that provide the foundation for the Whole Man Project. Uh, They'll be talking about loving God and others with our whole heart. So has anything or anyone broken your heart recently? Well, that's the question Rasul has for the group. In our last conversation, we gave the overview that the whole man project that we're working on is based on the greatest commandment to love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, head, hands and soul. So in this conversation, we're going to focus on the heart part of that passage. What does it mean to love the Lord, your God, with your heart? So let's start with this question. When is a time you've been heartbroken by a person or a circumstance? As we record, I immediately think of. Uh three days before today uh, was my grandmother's funeral. Mm. Uh, We laid her to rest at 88 years of age, and it was colon cancer that caused her to lose quite a bit of weight, lose memory. It was drawn out, but we saw her decline over Mm -hmm. time. So watching it and then the funeral itself were like maybe two different kind of grievous experiences. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. Oh, grandmas are the best. Yeah. 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 I think about... I think it's Bob Pierce, the founder of World Vision, who Mm -hmm. would say to let your heart be broken by the things that break God's heart. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think of, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, orphans, or I think about fistulas in the Middle East, or I think about the suffering in in Gaza and Israel, or, you know, Mm -hmm. just I could go on and on, but going ahead to look and let our hearts be broken. Yeah. um, My youngest son has three kids, the oldest of which is six. 
and his name is Bruce, and he's my guy. Bruce is my guy. All the other grandkids love Grandma, but Bruce is <laughs> Papa's guy, so, so we're kind of together. What's wrong with him? And, uh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> nobody's figured it out yet, and I'm glad. <laughs> um, but uh, they recently got him a dog, mm-hmm. and the other two kids just could not adjust to having this extra being mm-hmm. in the house. And so they ended up rehoming the mm. dog and breaking Bruce's heart, oh. which broke my heart. Yes. Oh, you know, wow. That hurts on he, a lot of levels. Yeah. He, he was so taken with this little puppy and just loved it so much. And, and then to have it taken away was, was pretty tough. And I'm not questioning their judgment as parents. They've got to make that call. I just look at my guy mm. and say, oh, mm-hmm. man, he's hurting like crazy. Mm. Right. Yeah, I would say probably the most painful heartbreak that I've been through was my grandma's death as well. She died on Christmas morning and she and I were like super close. She lived on her property and I spent all my time at her house mostly because she would watch TV with me and feed me. Um, (laughs) But she was just the best. So that was probably the one that was most heartbreaking for me. Yeah, I think about the first heartbreak I can rem- remember in middle school was about a girl I had a really big crush on. Yeah. And I thought she liked me because <laughs> she tripped over my feet one time and kind of gave me a look like it was somewhat like, oh, she did it on purpose. So eventually, <laughs> after a few weeks, I worked up the nerve to, again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to ask her to go to, like, because instead of just saying, hey, can we be boyfriend, girlfriend, I thought, oh, if I just ask her to go to the dance, that'll give me like a a nice little hint. So I worked up the courage Friday after school and said, Hey, uh, would you go to the dance with me? And she turned and looked at me and said, now, why would I do something like that? Oh, no. And I was Ouch. Crud- Yeah. It wasn't just a rejection. It was like, it was a yeah. sledgehammer. Now. And, um, Oof. and I was devastated, but the reality is, you know, circumstances, broken relationships can cause our heart to be sick, right? Well, what does a broken heart or heartbreak have to do with loving the Lord your God with all your heart? Well, I think that there's a couple other passages that kind of give us a clue. In Proverbs 13, 12, we read, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. In Proverbs 4, 23, we're warned, you know, keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flows the springs of life. So, What if there is a sense in which all of these things that we talk about, whether it's disappointments and things that are happening in our hearts, what if what we do with those things actually relates to if am I bringing it to God or am I not bringing it to God? Am I loving God with all of those things and all of the passion or not? And so what do you think it means to keep your heart with all vigilance? Well, I I would kind of say at least in part, um, I would go back to the first verse you read, Mm. Rasul, hope deferred makes the heart sick. What have we set our hopes on? Mm. Part of keeping your heart with vigilance, I think, is setting your heart on the right things or healthy things or appropriate things. And again, there's so many times we could talk about in our lives, whether it's a a favorite sports team. I mean, I'm a Cleveland Browns fan, so I'm used to having my heart broken (laughs) every year forever and ever. Um, But I mean, you know, whether stuff, stuff like that, you know, holding a lot of things loosely instead of clinging to them and putting our hopes into them because hope deferred losing a Super Bowl makes the heart sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that is really helpful with like the tendency we have to put hope in how much, you know, money we can save to kind of protect ourselves from bad things or at least as much as we think we can. I think what's harder to think about with this verse is what Malik shared, right? Losing his grandma through a bout with cancer. My grandma had a heart attack. Like those are things where like you can do all you want to try to be ready. But when those moments happen, they still are shocking and unnerving. And I think it's much harder to think about what it looks like to keep your heart with all vigilance in preparation for those moments. Well, and Daniel, it's so good because life hurts. I mean, mm-hmm. it just is painful. And so it, instead of being stunned by it, you know, if we can remember where to put our heart, 
because pain is inevitable. We are going to encounter whether it's death or disappointment or, you know, whatever it is. And yeah. then we just live around needs all the time. I think of uh, my first introduction to this verse, it actually said diligence rather than vigilance. But I, I think of both definitions kind of tying in with this idea of discipline. So I, I see it pointing us to this idea of what some other versions say, kind of just guarding your heart, having some level of discipline in relation to what you expose yourself to, mm -hmm. how you process through these painful experiences. Mm -hmm. But also it immediately reminds me of the Song of Solomon about awakening love before it's time. Mm -hmm. So j just thinking of idea, okay, well, what are you doing with your, with your heart? And I think one of the things that is helpful to understand in the Hebraic understanding, lavav, heart, means a lot more than just this, you know, organ that beats, right, or this muscle. It's the inner man, the mind, the will, the heart, the soul, the understanding, like all of that kind of inner world stuff is part of what we think of when we read heart in the Old Testament, um, mm -hmm. yeah. where it's like even in the midst of the things that are wrecking my inner world, do I love God in the midst of it? That's a good way to put it. And do you go through the process of grief and not just try to find a silver lining or move mm. past it too quickly or whatever, but actually mm -hmm. yeah. sit in that and have time to remember memories with your grandma or with the person that you've lost or with whatever the heartbreak is. That's another way that we strengthen our hearts and defend our hearts and guard our hearts in the midst of grief and pain is we actually let them do what they need to do through processing that grief, walking through that pain mm -hmm. and not trying to move past it too quickly. No, that's so important, Daniel. That's such a key part of what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, not compartmentalizing and putting mm -hmm. this part of me and say, he can't have that part of me. Yeah, that's you know? good. Mm -hmm. Because that hurts too much or this part is too special. Like you mentioned, Bill, about, you know, your special guy, you mm -hmm. know, and his grandson. And it's like, it would have been disordered for you to try to intervene and say, no, we're going to keep that puppy or I'm going to get him another puppy. Like, but it's like what it means to bring all of that and trust God with our heart, right? And lean not to our own understanding means to allow for him to be the highest hope that we have. And in doing so, it allows even the difficult things, even the painful moments to be ones that we can entrust him with all our heart. When we think of, of loving God with your heart, I think, about how First Corinthians 13 tells us about love being hopeful. Mm. Mm. So I balance it with this idea of although circumstances are difficult, I'm reminded that God still has good intentions. So even being hopeful rather than looking at the person who's in control of all things as the one who did this, recognizing that God still has good intentions for me even when I don't have circumstances that feel good. Mm. Mm. And so when we embrace the love that God demonstrates to us in Jesus, it frees us up to love God and others fully, completely, and without division or disorder. We can prevent the tendency to project onto God and others the pain of our past. We can reject the competing loves that might be competing with us in the world and completely commit ourselves to loving God with all our hearts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hey, heart and soul. Be healed, be new, be known. Live and be whole. Be whole. Yeah, holistic hearts. That's the aspect of being whole that they talked about in that segment and what it means to love God with your whole heart. Well, next, they want to reflect on your work and specifically how you do it. Now, our work consumes a lot of our hours and a lot of our energy and our strength, both physically and emotionally. And so how much would you imagine how we use our strength would matter to God? Well, this is another important aspect of your life that contributes to your being whole. And when it's not going well, well life is out of balance and something's missing. Let's listen. So we've talked about our hearts even our broken hearts win -win. <laughs> yep. and loves. Yep. Now in this conversation about the whole man, we will look at the external expression of that love. Jesus said part of the great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your strength. Now, 
interestingly, most of the time that the word used for strength is used in the Bible, it's in regards to God's strength, Mm -hmm. God's might. But there are times when it's used to reference people, specifically in the New Testament, 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. Can someone read that for us? Sure, I got it. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Did y'all notice something interesting that Mm -hmm. happened in that passage? Yeah. By the strength that God supplies. Mm. Right. Mm. So there's this acknowledgement that strength comes from God, but also there's an exhortation that we serve with that strength. Yeah. Right. That That strength, not our strength. Exactly. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. God is glorified, not just in our worship, but in our work. In fact, in Hebrew, avodah is the same word for worship and work. What do you think are the implications of that for us? Yeah. So I was in the moment as you were leading up was thinking about how I've expressed previously that our free will that we are given is meant to be used to glorify God. So, yes, it's ours. I can make the choice. I can do what I want. But there's this expectation that in that freedom that I've given you, bring it back to me. Mm. So that's our work is, in essence, worship because we're yielding to God with the freedoms that we have. Yeah, and I love that because will is another expression of that sense of strength, right? Like even willpower we talk about. It's interesting, Martin Luther talked about the fact that no matter how small a task it might be, whether it's hoeing a garden or changing a diaper, if it is done to the glory of God, it's an act of worship. Mm, That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm, Changing a diaper as an act of worship. Moms. (laughs) My <laughs> mops might have something to say about well, that. Well, what else are we going to do? But yeah, <laughs> I was actually thinking about Brother Lawrence, Ooh, yeah. his whole book on practicing the presence. And yeah, I think moms <laughs> learn to do that. But I think it's so concrete, you know, whether or not he was scrubbing a floor or washing a pot, that can be an act of worship. One of the times that I was in Israel, we were at the Western Wall of the Temple Mount. They call it the Wailing Wall. And there's a men's side and there's a woman's side and you have to have a kippah on your head to, if you're a man to go up there. And I noticed that there were several young Jewish men up there and they were very vigorously leaning forward and back, forward and back, forward and back, almost like a piston. Mm-hmm. And and I asked our Israeli guide, why do they do that? Mm-hmm. And she said, well, they're loving the Lord their God with all their strength. Wow. Because mm. every ounce of energy they have in them, they're putting it into that bowing repeatedly as they pray. And and I just thought, I don't know that I would have ever made that mm-hmm. connection, but mm-hmm. their energy yes, mm-hmm. was going into what they were doing. Yeah. It also reminds me of in liturgical churches, liturgy is called the work of the people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so there's a sense in which within worship, when we come in and and serve or lead or whatever we're doing within worship, there's a sense in which we're also at work. Sometimes I think we lose sight of that because we think of church as like the place where we worship. But how do we worship? Well, it's through like doing stuff with our bodies and through interacting with others and all of that, which connects both what happens at church with Mm -hmm. all of our everyday lives as well. Mm -hmm. And I think we'd be remiss if uh, if we didn't mention that from a secular perspective, especially when it comes to men and masculinity, our ears perk up with the idea of work. But the world presents this idea of work being uh, proving your value. Look at how much money I make. Look how I provide. It's Mm. more bravado. Mm -hmm. But the idea of work going hand in hand with worship is redefining that from a Christian man's perspective that this isn't being done to prove my value, but it's because of the value of the God I serve. So glad you brought that up. Mm. That was exactly what I was going to get into. What do you think is the relationship between men in particular and work? Identity. Yeah, it's identity, mm-hmm. 100%. I mean, we get our identity from what we do. And when you meet somebody new, often one of the first questions they ask you is, well, what do you do? Mm-hmm. It's like, I can't really know you unless I know what you do. And it really does become that thing that kind of marks us and places us somewhere on the spectrum within the culture. I'm thinking back to the garden and the fact that work was created before we fell and broke. So there is something very sacred Mm -hmm. about Mm -hmm. it. But then I'm also thinking about how our breaking corrupted 
our experience of work. And I think what you just pointed out, Malik, in terms of, you know, it can morph, distort our identities, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think just for a second, because I know my girlfriend's listening, you're going, why are you talking about men all the time for? You know, just (laughs) can we bring that out? Why are we uniquely focusing on the plight of men, especially black men, for this particular look? And what can a, a woman learn? How can we be more understanding of our brothers? Yeah, I think, one, there is this sense where, I think throughout the scriptures, there's a value in when we're seeing, you know, if one of us is suffering and all of us are suffering. Yeah. And there's some significant things that we think, hey, God's word has something to bear with how men are dealing with issues of loneliness. Men are dealing with issues of overworking Mm -hmm. and finding their identity in work. And that affects everybody because how many times have we seen even in movies or TV or in our own lives, someone because their identity, a man, was was shaped by the culture telling them you got to keep working, you got to keep making more money, that they end up estranged from their own families, yeah. Yeah. not taking care, not changing the diapers, not doing the things because their identity is is bound up in something that isn't a reflection of what God says is true about them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it'd be important Thanks. specifically for, for women is not discrediting men as a whole in correlation to their ability to provide. Mm-hmm. So many men lost their jobs during COVID and then there was a spike in demand for therapy. So I think mm-hmm. about how it's important to understand that men's perceptions of themselves are oftentimes, and this is black men, white men, this tends to go across cultures. It is heavily tied to how women perceive us. Mm-hmm. So I think in the context of romantic sense or even family, it may be important to affirm that man regardless of job status or income. Yeah, and there's another layer that I think is easily broken within us as men because sometimes we see other jobs or careers as the thing that we wish we were more able to do. And so there's always a lack of contentment and feeling of incompleteness because I didn't make it as a professional soccer player or whatever, right? Like, like oh, I really wish I had the glory of that job which is also tied to identity. And because I don't have that, it's hard for me to just be content with the work that God has invited me into. And we look down on each other the same way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's why it's important for us to set the foundation right. Like God creates man in his own image, you know, male and female, he creates them prior to work. So then he gives them work, not for them to define their identity by what they do, but to walk in the identity of being image bearers, Mm. you know, as they do what they do. And that's a subtle but very important difference that can cause us to either be imprisoned by our job or even the things that we aspire to do that we haven't have been able to do. Because someone actually read uh, Colossians 3.23, because I think that really relates to this. Yeah. Whatever you do, work heartily. As for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. Whatever you do, work heartily. Did you ever see the protest signs, the I am a man signs sometimes in black and white that you see? Those signs were worn in a protest specifically during civil rights era where in 1968 in Memphis, this is right actually the protest that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was planning and being a part of when he was assassinated in Memphis. And what had happened was over the years, black sanitation workers were being paid less. They had unsafe equipment that caused some deaths, like people to be killed in the trucks. And so they wore these signs that said, I am a man that was trying to get to this fundamental aspect of like this basic truth that, yes, I pick up trash and throw it into the back of a truck, but this is dignified work because I'm doing something that is, you know, of honorable, that God sees me in a certain way. So regardless if you're a sanitation worker or an ambassador at the UN, the same admonition is there. Whatever you do, work heartily for the Lord, knowing that you're serving him. And when we do that, we start to see ourselves really reflecting the image of God that he's already instilled in us to have. Another aspect of the wholeness that the whole man project stresses, and that is our work and what we spend our strength on. 
You're listening to Discover the Word and a series of conversations in this episode that are focusing on the foundational values in the greatest commandment that together contribute to our wholeness in our relationship with God and our relationships with others. All right, so the next aspect of being whole that the group will explore together is loving God with all our mind. Now, what does that even mean? And what does our mind include? Well, I think you'll be surprised and challenged by the direction this part of the conversation goes. Malik leads us through this segment. In Mark 12, 30, it says, And you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. So when we think about the mind, it's important to consider the many different ways that the mind is affected as we live this life. So if, if anyone's willing, could you read Philippians 4, 4 through 9? Mm. Yes. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So as a mental health professional, but also a Christian, I, I read that and I see a lot of overlap between hmm. the idea of therapy and counseling and just the Christian worldview. But I also understand that sometimes in Christian circles, this idea of, quote, secular psychology might be seen as taboo or counterintuitive to a Christian worldview. But I don't want to assume that that's everyone's experience. Have you observed that at all where therapy or counseling is maybe taboo in a Christian setting? Not so much taboo, but suspect. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's just kind of held at arm's length. And mm -hmm. that's kind of the tradition I came out of. And it's kind of a shame, you know, honestly, because I remember talking to Dr. Christina Edmondson and her making the point that the brain is an organ. And, you know, if you had a heart problem, you would go to a doctor. And mm -hmm. so if we have a mental health problem and it's in, maybe in our brain, maybe in our emotions, it's legitimate and it deserves to be treated. Yep. So I help lead our ministry effort to basically 18 to 39 year olds and the amount of conversations in this space. I mean, anytime we post anything related to mental health, it just always gets shared a lot. Mm -hmm. People comment on it a lot. So I know it's something that is really desired to be talked about. And some of the critiques that I've heard of people who point that out in younger generations within the church will say things like, well, that's just a lack of maturity or they just need to learn to get over it, or they just don't have enough faith Find to get past Christ their depression. Yeah. They just need to believe that God can you know, get them past this or whatever. And then even to one extreme of some of the charismatic brothers and sisters I know who are very intense about like, hey, if someone's struggling with this, this is an evil spirit, we need to cast mm -hmm. it out. So there's like this whole spectrum that I've seen within the church about this. Yeah, I've had my own journey with this because I think on one end, even from a philosophical standpoint, I can understand some of the reservations in light of some of the dynamics of where modern psychology, you mm -hmm. know, gets its founding Sigmund Freud or other people yeah. when you, you start mm -hmm. to even see people kind of formulate an alternative approach to their soul being at peace is, oh, instead of going to church or kind of bringing this upward to God, let me just do this other thing. And so I, I think I can appreciate that. And that also understand, just like you said, Elisa, with a doctor, you can also have doctors that, <laughs> you know, take you yeah. down the wrong path sure, or, sure. you know, and, and malpractice, but that doesn't mean I shouldn't, if my arm is broke, goes get some yeah. help. And so I think on a personal level, I think especially it's been hard to see men who feel like what it means to be masculine and strong and, and, and whatnot is to not acknowledge 
that there is some help that they need in working through something like anxiety or depression. So I think normalizing that conversation is important because I've seen folks struggle and suffer in silence. Mm. Yeah. And I was glad you brought us to this passage because this is one of those that I think is often misused in this space because mm-hmm. they're like, well, God tells you not to be anxious about anything. Yeah. So stop it. Yeah. I'm just really intrigued by the fact that when you say love the Lord your God with all your mind, you kind of go to the mental health side of things. And the tradition that I've come up through, love the Lord with all your mind, means use your brain, Mm -hmm. you know, learn. Education. Education, grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's much more of a cognitive approach to how we love the Lord our God with our mind as opposed to a whole mind uh, in terms of mental health that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're headed. So there's a lot of themes here that I think can help the Christian understand that you don't have to necessarily full sail accept all that the field of psychology presents you, but there are some things that we can benefit from. So one is this idea, like you just said, don't be anxious. So this can be this idea of feeling anxious feelings or an actual diagnosis of anxiety that we know exists and that can manifest in physical symptoms like sweating and increased heart rate and things like that that many of us do experience at different times but we all have our our ways of of managing that on a scientific level anxiety can be induced by this idea of cortisol which is a stress hormone like i said it can increase your heart rate increase your alertness it affects norepinephrine which is a neurotransmitter that can essentially make you feel anxious. So this is kind of the underlying factors that are happening with things that we generally describe as nervousness or anxiety. Mm -hmm. But to go further, the text also, after acknowledging anxiousness, it presents a remedy. It presents prayer Mm. as a remedy for one. So this is, again, these worlds combining because psychology will present remedies for anxiety as well, but it's something that God takes seriously. So at first, want to ask you, has prayer ever calmed you before? Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just about every time. Because <laughs> I mean, it seems like no matter what we pray about, we have some level of anxiousness about that or we wouldn't be praying right. about it. And just handing that off to the one who is greater mm. does give a calming. Yeah, and I would say different types of prayer have been more calming at different times. Sometimes just sitting in silence with God and letting the groaning of the spirit do the work of prayer is helpful. Sometimes things like breath prayer that have been passed down to us throughout the Christian church, the oldest being and most famous being Jesus Christ, son of God or son of the father, have mercy on me, a sinner, and just breathing that scriptures in and out. And then just also as this passage kind of points us towards just taking all the things I am stressed about And knowing I have someone to talk to in God, to be able to share those with and put them at his feet, because he's typically the only one that can actually do anything about Mm -hmm. whatever Mm -hmm. the thing is that has me anxious or whatever, too. So all of those have been calming things for me. Mm -hmm. So we have don't be anxious. We have prayer as a remedy. But next we have peace that surpasses understanding. So in the therapy space, the professional may oftentimes have to remind their client that, hey, you don't have the answers to this thing you're speculating about, or this Mm -hmm. isn't necessarily true or validated, even though you feel it or think it. So it's this idea of how do we deal with the unknown? And what this text is presenting this idea of you don't necessarily have to have all the answers. Mm -hmm. I'm providing a piece that'll work even if you don't, you don't get the answer. So we kind of have God presenting a cognition that is more healthy than speculating or creating narratives in our head that will then cause the anxiety that we're Mm -hmm. trying to remedy. You know, Malik, about a year and a half ago, this is going to sound weird, but hang with me for a second. Mm -hmm. (laughs) About about a year and a half ago, I was actually asked to write a book about worry. Mm Mm-hmm which is a form of anxiety, obviously. And and when they asked me to write, I thought, well, I'm an expert on the subject. I've, <laughs> I do it all the time, you know. <laughs> I, I know a lot about worry. And so I wrote this book, and this text in Philippians 4 was a key passage on how to respond when those anxious moments arise and stuff. And then a couple of months ago, I was diagnosed with precancerous colon issues. 
it wasn't colon cancer yet, but he said, if we don't deal with it now, it will be in a couple of years. So that kind of shot the anxiety mm-hmm. level to 15. And um, <laughs> and I told my wife, I said, it's almost like mm. the stuff in the book that I wrote about worry <laughs> that could be seen as theoretical is now being put to the test mm, at yeah. a very practical and personal level. And we found that as we prayed about the upcoming surgery and the procedure and all the stuff related to it, that this really literally happened, that God did give us this mind-boggling peace <laughs> mm. that that really was what carried us through the whole process and everything. And I'll be willing to admit that it was really scary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'd never mm-hmm. had surgery before except cataracts, and that's just, you know, five minutes, and they take it out and put a lens in. But, I mean, this is the first time in my life I'd ever had any kind of surgery so the whole experience is outside my point of reference. And the more we prayed about it, the more we sensed God's peace in it, even though we still didn't understand it any better. Yeah. Like you said, we didn't have any solutions. Mm. No, we didn't have any of that, but we had peace. Yeah, sometimes yeah. when I pray this for people, I pray over them the fact that this is peace that doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Surpasses, Surpasses understanding. understanding. You're it's mind-blowing. God, yeah, <laughs> yes. you can experience peace in a situation that it makes no sense to experience God's peace. And we need to just say for listeners that in this moment, Bill is doing really well, and oh. he's healthy, and we're very grateful to God for that. Moving forward, we can kind of do these themes together. So after acknowledging don't be anxious, prayer as a remedy, peace that surpasses understanding. We also see to guide our minds and hearts. And we can do that by where we choose to focus, meditating on things that are noteworthy, of a good report, Mm. that are good. That is us in practice guarding our hearts and minds on what we choose to think about. Mm -hmm. And so often anxiety and depression, while they can be induced by a variety of factors, we can be the ones that are creating it in ourselves by what we choose to speculate about and think about and meditate on. So we're being challenged here as a therapeutic intervention coming from the Bible to choose to think <laughs> uh, about the things that are good. It's so important, Malik. And, you know, I'll, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and my head will just be, you mm-hmm. know, spinning out of control. And I have to go, what am I thinking about? I might be thinking about a grown child. I might be thinking about a work project. And I'm so with you. I have to choose to go, God, I trust you with that. I trust you that you are good. I trust you that you know how this will resolve. I trust. There, There is a response. And yes, peace will come. But it's up to me as well to enter into that trust. Yeah, and I think about the relationship of all this together. You know, Bill asked a question about like the traditional way of thinking about love the Lord your God with all your mind as an intellectual Mm -hmm. pursuit, which is how I thought about it for a while. But then when we see this holistic approach, we realize this makes sense because these, look at the words that are used in this passage, anxiety, understanding, thinking, reasonable, like, Even guard your mind and heart. Mind and heart, right. Mm -hmm. So there's this holistic approach where the way we understand who God is can affect our sense of anxiety. And the way that we are struggling with things can be responded to through having a a therapeutic intervention as well as a theological understanding. And those things can come together. Mm Mm-hmm. And all of this is summed up well with this idea of cognitive behavioral therapy, which Mm -hmm. is also called CBT. It pretty much is kind of pulling the curtain back and looking at the cognition. What are you thinking? So cognitive behavior, what are the behaviors of your mind? How are you processing through your experiences and your feelings? And essentially, before it was even labeled CBT, we always see that happening here in the text that Mm. God is challenging us to look at the thoughts and see if this valid or not. Mm. And then adjust accordingly by focusing on the things that you do know to be true that are good rather than speculating about the hypothetical things that may be bad or evil. So we see CBT in the Bible long before Mm. it was even called Mm. CBT. So I pray that through this conversation, everyone's able to, to go in peace today with confidence knowing that God cares for for all of who you are and also understanding that although we face emotional turmoil, God has already had those remedies in mind. Mm -hmm. There is an awareness Mm -hmm. of the wholeness of who you are and your human experience fully seen through Jesus who experienced the same experience that we live daily. 
Dr. Malik Blade leading that part of the conversation about the head or mind aspect of our wholeness in Christ. It's one of the four areas mentioned in the Great Commandment, and it's one of the foundational pillars of the Whole Man Project from our Daily Bread Ministries and our Voices Collection. Now, Voices is a facet of our Daily Bread Ministries, which develops and distributes resources by black Christian content creators for communities of color. And so for the project, Rasul and Malik co-wrote the Whole Man book, along with Jerome Gay. This book digs in further to what we're discussing with them and inspires men to grow closer to God with their entire being. The book is called The Whole Man, 40 Spiritual Reflections from Black Men on the Head, Heart, Hands, and Soul. And then there are also some specially created videos that help you understand and discuss the whole man themes that are included in the book. The book supplies you with some QR codes that will take you to those videos. And then the Whole Man Project has a website where you can find these materials and more. Hope you'll check it out at experiencevoices.org slash whole man. That's experiencevoices.org slash whole man. All right, well, soul food, soul music, being a soul man. How does the aspect of loving God with all our soul fit into this discussion about being whole, being a whole man? It seems like kind of an abstract way to think about loving God with our soul. So let's wrap up this edition of the podcast about the whole man. Well, we have so far discussed what it means to love the Lord our God with our heart with our hands, our strength, with our mind. And in this last conversation, we go to soul, which is kind of one of maybe more ambiguous or complicated mm-hmm. yes. in that greatest commandment and from Mark 12. And can we pause for a minute and just remind us why we're talking about men? Yes. Because this verse is obviously for all of us, but we really are wanting to focus in on right. the whole man. Yes. So, you know, we were able to work, Dr. Malik Blade and I, as co-editors on the Whole Man Project, along with Pastor Jerome Gay. Um, so shout out to him. And we really wanted to create a resource to speak to the unique challenges that we're seeing with men experiencing wholeness. There's a lot of brokenness that is happening. And we think that that affects everybody. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. A rising tide lifts all boats. That's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so that if we can build up men in this area, we think that it will be helpful for us all. And so even though these themes are universal, we have thought about specific ways that we need to address that in the context yeah. of men. Thank you. In the context of the whole man, we focus on the entirety of our lives and the struggle we have to harmonize life with God. And even though it can feel ambiguous, when we start to look into some specific passages, we start to see soul come alive. So we're going to look at Psalm 42, the first Mm -hmm. six verses. And if we could just kind of take turns going around the table, maybe reading one or two verses each, that'd be great. Malik, how about you start us off? As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come? and appear before God. My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So we see in this passage Mm -hmm. soul a lot. Yeah. What are some things that you think about when you see this passage or that is coming up in terms of how soul is used here? I think of emotions. Mm -hmm. It's Mm -hmm. it's very emotional, at least to me. You know, I'm thirst for God. I pant for God. There's longing, this yearning. And then being downcast, I'm depressed. <laughs> I it, it pour feels, out my soul. Yeah, it yeah. feels very emotional to me. Yep. And the writers trying to get their head around what's going on inside of them, around them. And so the best they can do is like, it's like I'm... It's like my whole being is like thirsting, right? Mm. Like that, that seems like a good metaphor because of 
yeah. our relationship as humans with water and how much we need water. And without water, we don't live, right. right? And we can go longer without food than we can without water, yeah. right? So there's like, how do I kind of paint this picture of how much I, I need God? Yeah. It's it's like I'm thirsting for him. It's like I'm panting after mm. him. I think it is deliberately using this physical metaphor again, yeah. because what does Jesus say in the Beatitudes? You know, blessed are they who hunger and thirst mm. for righteousness, yeah. for they will be filled. Mm. And so we see this holistic dynamic of the soul. We can be thirsty spiritually and thirsty physically. So... This aspect of the soul, I think, is especially interesting and in even the use of that word in the African-American experience. Any of us heard of soul I, food? Well, <laughs> not just soul food, but right. soul and music. Yes. Mm-hmm. And all that as well. Yeah, And it's this word that is, mm-hmm. is really interesting. And when we say soul music, soul, what is it? It's this reference to things that were created in the context of hardship, mm. in the context of difficulty. So like soul food, for instance, was in the context of the hardship of slavery where Mm -hmm. there were meager rations. And so people took what they could and made something great out of it. And the same thing with music where Mm -hmm. it's addressing these painful issues of life. And I think that's what we get in this Psalm, you know, David addressing these issues of life. So when you think about that, does that kind of start to bring out and elevate this idea of the soul? It makes me think of the the phrase of making lemonade out of lemons <laughs> uh, it's just taking your life experience and putting it into some type of form whether it be food or music but in the spiritual sense kind of pouring mm. out to god so it's not just one thing because it's not just the feelings about what happened but it's what happened in its totality mm. um, and how it affects how you perceive yourself in life so it just connects me to this idea of taking the experience and then doing something with it for good. Yeah. Mm. And what really jumps out to me in this passage is the section in verse four in particular, where the psalmist is like, how am I supposed to lead all these people in worship when for me, my tears have been my food, uh, Mm -hmm. as he mentions early on, right? Like the hardship that the psalmist has gone through and yet there's these responsibilities that he has to walk through. Yeah. And, you know, we've been talking throughout this whole series about the whole man and how when one suffers, it affects all of us. That's good, Daniel. And yeah. there's a sense in which, like, our brothers are suffering. So mm-hmm. what does that look like for us to help them lead in these moments where tears have been their food and they still have these responsibilities they're trying to figure out and walk through? That really jumps out in this passage. Uh, What jumps out to me, Daniel, is we've talked in earlier discussions about the danger of quick fixes. Stop worrying. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, done. And I'm not saying this is in a quick fix category, but when you read the psalm, he he goes through all the pain and struggle in verses 1 through 4. And then he has this moment of reflection. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil? Hope in God. What's the matter with you? But then in (laughs) verse 6, he goes right back into trouble and struggle again and then comes back with the same refrain at the end. I mean, the quick fix doesn't fix necessarily, even when it's the right fix. Mm. I mean, putting our hope in God is the right fix, but that doesn't mean it's going to solve all our problems in that moment. Absolutely. And I think the thing that we want to normalize here, because sometimes there's so much shame with men around struggle, Mm -hmm. around this aspect of wrestling. And there's something specifically in this idea of how they may perceive, how we may perceive masculinity that can even just feel bad about the fact that I don't have a fix. I can't fix it. We're fix it people, right? right. Like we're told to fix things. And so even that refrain, why are you cast down, oh my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? It repeats, hope in God. Mm -hmm. I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. And I think we want to normalize the struggle. You know, one of the clearest pictures we get a struggle is with Jacob wrestling literally (laughs) with God. And in the midst of that, this is in a moment where he is afraid of his brother, maybe going to kill him because he stole his birthright. All these things that are happening. But the wrestling with God, you know, allowed him to be in a place where God actually changed his name. And change his name from this idea of deceiver to one who struggles with God. And I love how he was so committed to getting the blessing from God (laughs) that he wasn't going to let go until 
Yes. He had this true transformational moment. Mm. You know, and, and I think the psalmist is similar. Like what you're saying, Bill, is the, it's not an easy fix, but it's a perpetual need. Yeah. And just like thirst is, as you were pointing out, Daniel. And, and so just our, our soul's hunger and thirst for a relationship with God that won't let go mm. until we get what we need. Yeah, that's the, I'm going to misquote it like everybody does, but that's the Blaise Pascal. In every one of us, there's a God-shaped void that only mm-hmm. God himself can fill. Yeah. And mm-hmm. when we try and fill it with other things, whether it's work or other stuff, it's never going to fill that void because only God can fill it. This is a, a great opportunity to encourage men who are listening to this to don't give up on the struggle. Hmm. Don't give up on the wrestle, right? That is okay and more than okay it is actually noble to be struggling with your soul to be thirsting after more from god and whatever that might hit you whether that's in your vocation and in work and not being where you wanted to be or where you had dreamed it whether that's in relationships and being heartbroken you know whether that's in your mind Mm -hmm. and the aspects of just just you know depression or anxiety keep wrestling because in the wrestle god will give you a new name and allow you to walk in a new reality. No longer just what your past has been or what the brokenness of the past has told you, but in the newness of what it means to be a whole man. Mm -hmm. And that's what we hope we can encourage and inspire men to, but also women Mm -hmm. who are are in this struggle. Don't give up on the brothers, (laughs) you know what I mean? But hold hold out hope Mm -hmm. for them. So this has been such a a great discussion. Thank you, Dr. Malik Blade for joining us. Thank you. And being a part of this whole man series and project and for all of you for jumping in the convo as well yeah, that was a worthwhile and challenging conversation wasn't it uh, rasul berry dr malik blade who worked together on the whole man project through our voices collection at our daily bread ministries led the study and at the table with them were from our regular team elisa morgan bill crowder and daniel ryan day Learn more and get the book, access to the videos, music, and more resources at the Whole Man Project website by visiting experiencevoices.org slash whole man. That's experiencevoices.org slash whole man. Discover the Word is a small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ and point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. And just one more thing. Can I ask you to help us here at Our Daily Bread Ministries multiply what matters? The Whole Man Project, the Voices Collection, Discover the Word, the Our Daily Bread devotional, video, podcasts, and even more. That's all part of Our Daily Bread Ministries. And when you partner with us financially, you're making it possible for us to continue connecting people with the life-changing message of the Bible around the world. Learn more about how to give at discovertheword.org when you click the Donate button that's up at the top of the page at discovertheword.org. All right, well, thanks for listening. I'm Brian Hedinga. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries.